when we have something to tribute to God, out of his heart, he can make piano sing so well. Praise the Lord. Keep it up, Ben. Keep it up. Good job. Let us pray before we start. Gracious Heavenly Fathers, we want to thank you, Lord, for the gift that you have given to Ben, his family. May you continue to use him. May you continue to bless him, Father. Whenever he pray, your glory has been seen, Father, in him. May you be with us today as we speak for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to say thank you to all of you for being here this morning. You have choices to go to many churches, but you are still here. Praise the Lord for your love to Thai Church and the Lord who live in this place as well. I want to thank God that last week, a week before last, I have gone to visit Europe and some country. Thanks to technology of today, so you can go fast and you know, one or two days you are there and come back again. And praise God for that. But I have been in Europe the first time in my life. It was a thrill to be able to see different cultures, different people, different technology, I mean, the uh, architecture, and history where it is. So we went there just to follow the, uh, what you call that, um, Martin Luther's and all those Reformation people, where they live, where they gone to school, and we went to um, France, also to uh, Czechy, where uh, we see the monument of Hush, John Hutch, where he stood up against the Pope, that all men have to have ability to think for themselves, not just to listen to somebody like Pope. And many people die because of him, and many people in that country until today, they blame John Hutch that they are not anymore worshiping God. A lot of people not go to church. Big churches, but there's no people in it. And we have gone to uh, Germany, visit Wittenberg University, and Worm, city of Worm, where um, Martin Luther stood up, even though the, they have the community, commu what do you call that, committee, to ask him to recant from what he teach and print. He stood up there and said, no, I cannot recant, as long as it is not go inside with the Bible. So that's where we visit Wittenberg, we visit Worm, we visit many places where he was born, where he baptized. And then we came to Switzerland and also visit Swingley and a university where he was. It was a good trip. 39 of us, all of us. Praise God, none of us sick. We have enjoyed the trip because most of them are pastor and pastor's wife. So praise God for that. And thank God I'm here back home safely to see you again, and praise God. Today I would like to um, bring you back to the story of David. We are trying to study about the life of David, the man who is after God's old heart. And you and I have to continue picking up here and there, whatever he, you know, traveling or his journey. And so I want to bring it out a little bit here and there in his life so we can learn from it that we can be one man or woman of the God's own heart somehow. Because David, it's a man like you and me. He's a sinful man and he's murderers and uh, he do all kinds of things, but God to love him. God can love all of us as well as uh, he loved David. Today I want to bring out um, about the crutch that David had. Maybe I can have the remote myself. 
Have you ever had opportunity yourself go up, you know, on the ski lift, and there you can feel all the fresh air and and the fresh air. The wind blew you, blew to your face, and you can feel the snip of your nose where the, where the um, icy wind passing through you. And you can look down and see panoramic view. You see all the snow will cover the earth. It's wonderful to see. I went up there to, um, to Mount Blanc and um, and then it was very high, it's about 5,300 some meters up. And we went up on the, uh, what do you call the ski, what would you call snow, you know, and they put you in that thing and you just go up on the cable, I think the cable car. And it was so cold, 30 degree below zero up there, and when you touch the wall, you can feel it. You know, it's so cold, no matter how much you put in here, it's still cold. Imagine those people go out there to do skiing. But somehow, you see the picture there, you jump off from the, the, the ski lift, and there you go, you see something else. Instead of seeing the slope, you're seeing the cliff. So what are you gonna do? You have to man maneuver to get yourself out somewhere. But anyway, somehow, you got an accident. You end up in the emergency room, and there the doctor told you that you have a broken leg, three places. And what do we do? You have to think about it. Many of us are in that situations you're going to know something that when you have broken leg, they're going to put something on your leg, right? And they will give you, what you call that, um, the wooden um, clutch. So you will stay in the clutch there for the next two, three months, or maybe six months, depending on how fast your bone can heal. This clutch, somehow we can use it for our spiritual illustration as well. David had some problem in his life. After he became a national hero, when he killed the giant, Goliath giants, and everybody loved David, everybody praised David, and Saul became a man of sadness and angry and envy against David. But anyway, let's look at what I wrote there. He said, um, not everybody has a broken leg, yet we all have some broken places in our emotions, bones, weaknesses, vulnerabilities, the crack in our character, make us lean on a crutch. When it's blown down by the live icy blast, you and I maybe have some experience sometimes. No matter what you do, you always have problems in your life. And uh, when the live situation hits you bad, you have a tendency to cling on and hang on someone else at the clutch. This is what the story we're going to talk about today with David. David hang on friend, hang on some things, just to hold on. But anyway, but God know how to help us to get out of those spiritual problems. Now, let's look at another note here. <clears throat> we all have spiritual, spiritual problems emotional problem, somehow, somewhere, each one of us have a broken place somewhere in our life. But this kind of spiritual clutch is not just like, um, it's just not like a wooden clutch. 
It takes time to be healed. Sometimes it takes a long time to get over the problem. It will not speed up. It sometimes retard for healing. Somehow God will be there for you and he's trying to remove those kind of clutch away for you one by one. Because if we are looking forward to God to help us, God have the way to help us out. As we're going to look into um, these clutches, we need to know about the truth about our clutches. We have to explore it a little bit how God will help us, but how this clutch holds us back from healing. Some of us as a Christian, we all know that we love God. We come and worship him. We do everything we can to, to make sure that we are together with God. But yet we still have problems, just like Saul has. He's a man of God. Saul was anointed to be king. He's supposed to be a leader of the whole country to bring people to know God. But yet he has his own mind. He has problem with jealousy. He has problem with madness. And everybody has to follow him. But somehow, these kind of crutches that we are talking about here, the first thing we have to know that it become a substitute for the Lord. If we depending on people, we do not depend on God. As we look at the text that the Lord have given us to, to hear in Isaiah 41, verse 10, he said, do not fear, the Lord said, for I am with you. Can you hear his voice? Do not fear, because I am with you. In the darkest night, when you go somewhere that in the dark, especially when we go into the kind of uh, the big um, hole, what you call it, in the cliff or somewhere, you, you get inside uh, and um, it's dark and you don't even know how to trust anybody. If you were to walk forward, you're afraid you might fall down, something like that. But if you believe in God and trust in God and hear his voice, do not fear for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you or do not dismay, that's the other word, for I am your God. If you hear God's word, God's voice, I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41, 10. Remember this text, my brother, sister, when you are in trouble in situation that you cannot handle yourself. Why we look at someone or something else to support you when God righteously, powerfully is willing to help you, why you have to look for those people? God is there for you. Choose God instead of men. Another, another thing is, it keep our focus horizontally. In other words, you are not looking at God vertically. You look at your human being, human friends, and everything that you can do, and you forget about God. It said, human crutches paralyze our work of faith. Probably people would say, well, I have faith, but I don't believe it until I see it. Somebody got to show up to let me believe in it. I pray to God, but I don't really, not sure whether God gonna listen to me or not. You see, when you have faith, and as uh, Brother James told us, or Apostle James told us, you should not be double-minded. You should believe whatever you ask God for that he going to send it to you. You believe in it. And he said, 
Let's not expect anything to happen for those people who have double-minded. They just, you know, vitalizing here and there. They are not um, concentrate on God. They only trust in human. That's what he said. When we look to those around us for support, we fix our eyes on human plane. And our godly vertical perspective is lost in the hazy horizon. As you know that uh, relationship to God, we go straight down and up. To human being, we go out this way. So somehow we can help it because we are human beings. So we cling to our friend, our relative, and, and become some kinds of um, dependence on you, on other people. Another thing that we have looked at is, um, it's that they offer only temporary relief. Friends may help you for a while. Pretty soon they will say, you better get out of here. Go look for a job. Do something else. I am get tired of seeing you every day in the house. You know what I mean? If you lost a job, you have no place to go, you go to your sister, your brother, or your friends. And pretty soon you get used to it, don't have to work. You just be there and they feed you. Months after month, later on they get tired of you. Just think of it, he said. It's just like aspirin to a broken bone. A human crutches relieve the discomfort and pain of a crisis only temporarily. Is it true? You have been there. You have been there. Only God can remove those crutches permanently. And many of us have seen people struggle, you know, in the world of um, homelessness. And we have some who are here with us. We're trying to help him. But he's still having problems. And he still have clutches that he hang on. But we will pray, we'll continue to help that person to be able to get better and start new life with God. Now, next thing is, how would we go about learning how to remove the clutches from our life? First of all, we have to think about the crisis David himself faced at that time. It said here, David's face put a limb in his spirit, making him desperate for support. Never before had it had been so vulnerable, and never again would he live free from memory of brokennesses and pain. It is very true, brother, sister, when you have problems, in your life. Your spirit was broken. You don't trust anybody anymore. And those experiences are clinging on you for a long, long time. And uh, you, you will not be able to forget it because it's there inside of you. But somehow, you know, we have to look at this as um, the the crisis that David had, we have to revisit it a little bit. See, it's happened that when David won the victory over the giant, just only very quick and very short moment, where everybody was so afraid of the giant, for 40 days, 40 nights, they were frozen. They can't do anything about it. But David came, and there he went. He said, the Lord is with me. And he will give the giant into my hand. And he took only a slingshot, five stone with him. And just a few moments, he just throw the stone or let go his sling. And the stone hit the head of the giant. That's the end of it. And he become a national hero all of a sudden. And, and you know that... Um, the ladies of the town all came out and sing the song and say, wow, you know, and, and uh, Paul was killing thousands, but David killed his ten thousands. 
Saul was so sad hearing that. He said, what's more? Are they going to give my throne to David next? And since then, the Bible said, Saul would put eyes on David. And he had to watch out for David, everything he do. Here we go. Saul turned against David after David killed Goliath. And he had many attempts at trying to put the spear on David and to pin him on the wall while David was playing the harp just to calm him down. But yet, the Lord is with David and he escaped. And next thing he said, well, maybe I should just send him out to the war and let the Philistine kill him. I don't have to do anything. So he sent him out and he came back with victory, and he feel bad about it. Man, he didn't die this time. The more he was so afraid of David, and next thing he was saying, maybe I should give my daughter to, to him, and I'll let my daughter, manipulate my daughter to do something to kill him. That's what happened. And David was listening to the king, and the king said, uh, I'm going to give the daughter to you, and you will become my son in law And David said, uh, King, I have nothing. I'm poor guys. I don't have no dowry for you. You know, what can I do? I'd rather not have a wife. And the king said, don't have to worry. Go out there and kill 200 Philistines and bring their foreskin to me and show me. That's it, the dowry for my daughter. David did it. He come back with the 200 foreskins uh, of Philistine, and the king just shake his head, what shall I do to kill this guy? So finally, he had to marry his daughter, to give a daughter to David, and now the king sent the soldier to his house and tried to kill David in his house. Thank God his daughter saved him and let him get out on the window. But yet, the daughter was not being pleased by the father, of course. And now, we have to look at this next thing, what happened is, how God is removed the crutch from David. You know, he has a lot of emotional problems. He has to cling on many people. And so, even though he didn't do anything with Saul at all, and he didn't try to prevent Saul from killing him, but God still chose to pull out crutches from David little by little until it's done. What happened here won't work. Brother, can you? Okay. So here it is. Some of us may not even look at it as the crutch because when you read the Bible, of course, this story is found in 1 Samuel and chapter 18 to 21. As you are looking at it, please continue reading with me. And when we come up with this story, you will pick up something that I found. So crutch number one with David's position, when he was with Saul, now Saul will keep him in the palace make him a captain of many soldiers. He could be a centurion, a captain of 100 or 1,000, whatever it is. And so he was serving Saul pretty, pretty well because he's the man of God. He's the man who do everything well. And every, every uh, what you call war he go out, then he came back victoriously. People love him. The soldiers love him. They admire him, you know. And, um, but anyhow, but Saul is so, you know, have vendita to go out and kill him all the way, all the times. But what can he do? As a man who loved his king, the man who have to play the harp for the king when the king get mad and when the power of evil coming in, David had to be the one to take care of him. What can he do? So God had to move him out of that by 
knowing that Saul is trying to kill him. Saul is trying to do everything to get rid of, of David, so he have to get out, and he have to say goodbye to Saul forever. That, number one, he get away from Saul. Number two, he still have a wife. And so Saul pursued David right to his home where his wife, uh, the daughter of Saul's name, uh, Michael, and, and then that night before he's going to be killed or captured, the wife let him escape. The problem with it is when King Saul come along and say, why do you do that? You're supposed to be my daughter. You're supposed to help me out. Why do you let David go out? So he said, you know that? He said he's going to kill me if, you, if, if I don't help you, him. And uh, you see, it, it is something that the wife is supposed to support the husband or say something good about the husband. And, um, but she is trying to save herself. Actually, she is not doing good thing for his, her husband. At the word, she betrayed him. But somehow, David have gone and escaped, forever and never come back to see her. Number three is that David mentor. So as you know that his mentor is Samuel. So after he get out from um, uh, his house, he went straight down to see Samuel, and then who anointed him, who also he looked forward to get all information about spiritual life, you know? You always have mentors somewhere, somehow. And so Samuel suggested, after David told him all the bad thing about Saul trying to do for David, and he said, let us go to uh, uh, Nayot. Nayot is the city where there's a temple and have a priest over there. And then the, they went there, but somehow Saul find out and came and killed the priest. And all the children, the wife, and everybody was killed because of he helping David out. So David had to flee one more time. And he had to say goodbye to his mentor and never come back and see the mentor again. Number four, David friends. So he went back to see Jonathan. That's the only friend he has at that time. Jonathan was the good friend that loved him, and he loved Jonathan. But after he went there and said, Jonathan, why is that your dad is trying to kill me? What have I done wrong? What sin have I done? You will be surprised sometimes. You do everything good towards somebody, your boss or somebody, but they're still there persecuting you, and you don't know what you're doing. And so you ask that question, Jonathan, what have I done? to deserve to die. And Jonathan come along and say, listen, brother and my friend, I will not let your, I will not let my dad touch you anyway. But David said, no way. I just in one step ahead of being killed. And, and then um, David still remember that when he was playing harp and here Saul hurled the spear to him not just one, but twice. And he would do all kinds of things to get rid of David. So he was not happy and sure. Finally, they have to say goodbye. It must be very hard to leave your friend, a broken hearted, to someone who love very much and go because there is some war, because something, they come after you. So there you go, another clutch was taken away. Next thing he does, you have no place to go. He went back go into the camp of Goliath's hometown. There, he went to see another king in Goliath's hometown, and then thinking that he can be there with him for a while, but anyhow, the people remember him. They would say, is that not the king the, of, uh, of Israel? He's the one that killed giants, you know, and he might come here and harm us. So David was so afraid, he was so afraid, he was seized and feared, 
and act like he's insane. He was crashed the, the, the gate of uh, the city and he will drool or making saliva coming out on his beard, acting like a weird, insane people. So the king of the city would say, ah, oh, he can't do anything harm to us. He's insane. So anyway, even though David is a good man, he's a man of God, but he lost himself here with his self-respect. No self-respect at all. But that's the way God somehow wean you out from where you're supposed to go. So anyhow, when God takes you away from those kind of crutches, he wants you and him to be together. That's where David have to go into the wilderness by himself. And later on, God bring all the people to come along to, to be with him, and we're going to follow on next time. But here, the thing is here, the lesson we can learn from this is that there is nothing wrong with leaning on your friends, but you should be lean to the Lord more. If you lean to the Lord, you can lean to your friend too, and you know the time when it's time to go. Some of us stay home with our parents 30 years, 40 years, never get out of the house because that the crutch that you want to hold on. Some people never finish school. They keep on going to school, become professional school uh, student. You know what I mean? Never want to get out there in the real world. Some people, husband and wife, the wife never learned to drive because she depends on her husband. Everywhere he goes, she goes. And she never learned to drive. When her husband dies, whatever, then you're going to learn how to hang, hang with somebody else. These are the crutches for us. Some of us come to church and never want to read a Bible for yourself. You just want somebody else to read for you. You just want a pastor to tell you what's going on in the Bible. That's the crutch also. You have to get out of those things. My dear brother and sister, God loves you so much and he wants you to get out of your own crutches. Here's another thing that um, uh, we need to remember. There's nothing wrong with, I just read that, as long as we go and, and, and leaning on the Lord. And um, we are built to be what you call that, uh, a guide, they call a leaner. Because we are human beings, we need to be together with somebody else. That's why we come to church here. We cannot just be home by alone, worshiping God alone. We lean on somebody. We lean on friends as well. We come together to make life happening, you know. So sometimes we cannot live by ourselves. We need someone to talk to. That's okay. But Solomon told us, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not, he said, lean on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, verse 5. Yet don't be overconfident. Some people will say, I don't really want to bother God in everything. I will do myself. If I can do it, I will do it. I'm a self-made man. God make me to give me a brain. I have to use my brain. I don't need God. Some people are like that. But we have to be the one that in everything we do, we got to come and consult in God. And God see everything. God, all everything. God know everything about your life. We will have trouble coming to our life every day. But James was saying, welcome your trouble. Count it all joy, brothers, because all the trouble is an instrument that comes from God. God wants you to learn it so you can be patient. When you perfect your patience, then your life will lack nothing. Everything you do, you'll be giving glorification to God. Amen? Amen. Patience is good. The problem comes, let's smiling at it. I say, what is God going to do with me today? He sent Trump trouble but I am going to learn from it. And just remember, God said, I will be always with you. 
I am your God. I will strengthen you. So you will be able to fight whatever you need to do. God will be there with you. Now, another thing is, as David have left his friend, it must be very hard. He left his wife, he left his friend. Being stripped of all crutches is one of the most painful of life experience. When you're depending on something and you were stripped off, and then it must be very hard. Like those with just a broken legs who misplaced their crutches, those whose human support have been removed feel incredible helpless, helplessness, loneliness, and pain. You will experience that. But just remember, God is your friend. God is going to help you to go through that. I want to leave this with you, my dear brother. The people on crutches, ample, awkwardly, and also uncomfortably, and they endure its itching limbs, sore armpit, and long and hard frustrations of days. Some of you have broken legs. You know how it feels to be on the clutch, you know? And uh, it's hard. But somehow, the Bible say here to us, in the same way, we who are supported by human crutches sacrifice greatly for our dependency. The race towards a maturity of faith is reduced when you depend on that to the hobble and the price of wholeness delay. So we have some text to look at it here before we finish. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangle, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. You know that if anything holding you back to come back to God, to serve God, you got to get rid of it. Let it go. All the hold back, all those clutches that hold you back from serving God. And the last text, do not know, do, do you not know that in the race all the runners run, but only one get the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. My dear brother and sister, God actually will give all of you a prize, but we must learn to run, to serve God the best we can do. We knowing God is with us as we walking, as we talking, or we go in the darkness, God is there. We don't need to worry about it because God is with us. God is always your God. Therefore, be confident in God and give him that number one trust. And God will be walking with you everywhere you go. Even though you have trouble like David had, but those trouble will get away from you. May the Lord bless you all. May your clutches be removed. Trust in God, and God will give you the wholesome of your heart. And God will give you rest, even though you're in trouble. But God is there with you. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we want to say thank you again, Lord, for all the promises that you have for us. And you said you will be our God. And you said you're going to be with us. Let us not worry, let us not dismay, because you will strengthen us if we have a broken leg. If we have a, a, a broken spirit, you will mend it for us, Father. May you be with my brother and my sister today. They're all your children. That they will be comforted because you are their God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
let us stand and sing our um, theme song together. <laughs> 